Well, for more, joining us now from Washington is Shaila Raghav, who serves as the climate change lead for the group Conservation International. Shaila, thanks for joining us. Let me ask you, I read a blog post that you wrote today on this report. You try to be optimistic. You talk about steps like reforestation. But as we saw in that report, the, there's a rise of populist governments around the world who uh, really don't take climate change perhaps as seriously as previous governments, including, for example, in Brazil, which has a big forestation problem. I'm asking you, how optimistic can you be in the face of this political challenge? I think that's the most critical question to ask right now. But we had a remarkable gathering a few weeks ago in San Francisco at the Global Climate Action Summit, which really was an important opportunity for all of the cities, states, investors, and communities of the United States to rise up and show the world that we as a nation, that we the people of the United States are serious about acting on climate change. We've seen a number of shifts, exponential shifts that are, are showing us that the that the generation the marginal cost of renewable energy is lower than coal and fossil fuels we've seen communities come together and reforest millions of hectares of land um, to show the world that that we're we're serious about acting on climate change so despite what our president can do or the his the lack of action um, there's still something that that we can do to to, to shift the the public sector and the investments that have a direct influence on our climate. I'm going to pick up on what you mentioned on the president. President Trump obviously pulled out of the Paris climate uh, agreement. Uh, how should we view that decision, the impact of that decision on behalf of the United States, no less, given the conclusions of this report? So I think it definitely is a step back. I mean, all of all of President Trump's decisions or in his lack of action on climate change have have set this back this country back economically, but also diplomatically. But I think that's where we have to show that non-state actors, that that uh, private sector companies, investors, communities, um, religious groups have an important role to play, and in fact, set the motion of direction in in, in many ways more so than our government. Charlotte, let me ask you, the winner of the Nobel, one of the winners of the Nobel Prize for Economics today is try to make the argument that moving to, a, a, for example, cleaner fuels and more environmental policies can actually help growth, not hinder it. But we have seen some politicians, which we've discussed, make the opposing argument and succeeding with voters. How much do groups like yours bear the blame for having failed to make convincing arguments to the public on, on the opposite. I think we definitely share some of the blame. I think oftentimes we've made climate change an environmental issue, but it's far more than an environmental issue. It's an, an issue that's that's uh, fundamental to our health, to our economic well-being, to our survival as humanity. And I think that's what this report shows. It's not a matter of luxury anymore. It's a matter of survival. So acting on climate change is an imperative. We need to make it a voting issue. We need to elect leaders that are serious about acting on climate change. We need to elect leaders that understand that there is. it's a false choice between acting on climate and growing and thriving as a society and humanity. Shaila, so let's take that a step further. You rightly say this is not only an environmental issue. The sort of commonly held goal is to keep the global temperature rise at, I believe, 1.5 degrees Celsius. This report says we're heading towards three. That might seem like a sort of abstract or small number to the average person watching. Explain the impact, especially economically, of that jump. So the, this report is a special report that was commissioned in particular to evaluate and assess the marginal difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees and also to evaluate whether or not it's even possible. Are we too far gone to even reach a 1.5 degree target? And what the report found is that there is a significant difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees. It's the difference between entirely destabilizing our Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. So it's a difference of inches of sea level rise to meters. It's also, it also shows that it means that we will uh, go from losing about half or 70% of our coral reefs to 100%. And each of those has significant economic implications. Sea level rise of meters would mean the entire obliteration of, entire, of cities or even nations. Um, uh, loss of coral reefs means that we, we're losing the, the nurseries for fisheries. 
and the livelihoods of, of hundreds of millions of fishermen around the world. So there are direct economic implications, even at half of a degree. And the message here really is that we have a decade, we have a few years to turn around the pathway, uh, the emissions uh, pathway, uh, to meet net zero by 2050, if we're going to avoid the most harmful impacts of climate change. Shrela, again, going back to uh, your blog comment on that report today, you spoke of uh, reforestation as a key element. I'd like you to expound on that because it strikes me that's a sort of positive, proactive step that may find favor with the public rather than, say, limitations on carbon use. All right, uh, Shyla, it looks like we lost her uh, for now for a moment. We're talking about something, you know, it's interesting when we, we step out of the sort of news of the day for a moment because there, there, you know, issue after issue, whether it's North Korea or the Syrian war or otherwise, that uh, are so dire and are spoken about so much, but we're talking about something that doesn't discriminate. We're talking about impact that goes uh, really across the board. I believe we have Shyla back with us. So I want to put that question, a Kalev's question to you again, a reforestation. Talk to us a little bit about that. Maybe how people sort of, you know, the average person who wants to help can take part in that step forward. So reforestation is a really important type of action that people can take because right now the only technology that we have to remove carbon out of the atmosphere is a tree. Uh, and so one of the things that we're doing at Conservation International is trying to expand the scope of reforestation and regenerative activities around the planet. This is something that, that people can do in their own backyards, and it's also something that requires large-scale investment. So in tropical forest areas that have already been cleared, we're working to bring the cost down so that it's, it's more affordable um, and it's an investment opportunity for people, landowners and people all around the world to take carbon out of the atmosphere and to restore our planet.